All right. Um, last time we did a simple validation, and that validation was to validate if we were submitting a form to the server. All right. So we did a simple text box, or actually a couple simple text boxes, and we had a non-submit event that when you clicked the button and submitted the form, it called a function. That function then evaluated the text boxes, saw if there was an issue, and actually did some things to manipulate the page. Again, we're going to keep coming back to these same things because if you look, there we go. Did I mention that in this class, how there's someone that, that rolls a card around looking for my classes and make noise just to, just to destroy my concentration? Um, at any rate, we're going to notice a real similar recipe to all these things. And that recipe is that we can point to things on the page and then we can do stuff with them. All right, it's very simplified, I realize. But specifically, we're going to point to form things on the page and like get their values. And that's going to tell us what we're going to do. In the case of the validation, it tells us whether it's valid or not, whether they put something in there or not. In other cases, we may put something in there and do a calculation with it. All right. So we're going to pull stuff out of forms, right, because that is the chief way that the user can um, give us values, to give us information for us to do our job. Then we're going to do some manipulation. And that manipulation might be doing some comparisons, whatever. And then we're going to, at least some of the time, change something about the page. All right? So in the, la in the, the, the last example, we pulled the values from the forms. We checked to see if there was something in there. And if there was not, we changed some text in an inner HTML field. And we changed the style of the label to make it a different color to indicate that, that there was an error. So again, that's going to be the recipe to a large degree. Pull stuff out of forms, do something with it, and then change the screen. Now again, there's variations in that. We don't always pull stuff out of forms, right, with the mouse over. But we do typically change elements on the page. What we're going to do today is we're going to start off and we're going to do a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion, one of the classics that I do in most of my classes. And um, we'll start out very simple where we'll have a text box. example in that this is not involving sending anything to the server. We're doing all these calculations on the client side. Why are we doing all these calculations on the client side? Because we can, right? The rules for converting Fahrenheit to centigrade and centigrade to Fahrenheit are real straightforward. It's just a simple little formula. It's not like you have to look something up in a database or have um, some elaborate system of doing that calculation. Or it's not like it changes from day to day. There's a different rule. For example, if we were converting currency, all right, it'd probably be good to do that on the server side. Why? Because the currency exchange rate varies from day to day. You know, today maybe a dollar is, I don't know, 0.76 euros. Tomorrow it might be 0.8 euros. The day after it might be 0.72. So it varies. So that would be something that would be good to ask a server, hey, what's today's conversion rate? And get that and do the conversion. But this Fahrenheit to centigrade is real straightforward, right? We can define it. We can define the formula. And that's how it is. And we don't have to worry about changing. We don't have to look up anything in the database. So we're going to do all this client side, which means that this is not going to be a submit button. This is just going to be a plain old button. Right? A submit button, remember, sends it to the server to be processed. In our case, we're not going to send it to the server to be processed. We're simply going to click it and invoke some JavaScript. 
So we'll start out with a very basic example like this. We can then, along the way, we can add some validation to make sure that they put something in. We can do actually a little bit better, and we can add some validation to make sure that they put in a numeric field. All right. Um, and um, we can um, do things like change the label if it's invalid. We could... Um, you know, display a text message if it's not valid. We could display a different text message if they don't enter anything versus if they don't enter a number. All right. Um, we can even do things like if the temperature is between certain range, display a different image. So like if the, if the temperature is less than 32 degrees, we can display an image of someone skiing. Very few people know I'm also a successful artist. All right. And if the temperature was, you know, above 80 degrees, we could show someone, you know, sitting on the beach or something like that. So we can actually customize a page um, without going back to the server. How do we do that? The same recipe we've done all along. We point to something on the page using the DOM. We then go and we manipulate its attributes. So we're going to build on this example. We'll take it today. We might go um, into next week uh, doing this. This is similar to the one lab that you have coming up, and we'll spend some time talking about that. Um, my suggestion always when you have a lab to do is look at it and try to break it down and do it a piece at a time. Don't try to hit a home run and do everything all at once. All right. Let's start out. Let's build a new page. today and use Notepad++. That was a joke. All right. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to put my basic HTML tags and my form and that stuff. And then we'll go in with the JavaScript. So HTR doc type. What does a doc type do? Pardon me? Tells you what kind of document it is. What does specifically this doc type do? HTML5. This tells the browser that it's HTML5. Um, that can give the browser some hints on how to display the page.
we're not submitting this to the server, just for good consistency, I'm going to give it a name and an ID. The ID is what's more relevant here. this 
point, when I'm done with the HTML and CSS, look at it, right? Got to make sure it looks the way it's supposed to before I start doing anything with it, manipulating a JavaScript. So I'll go and I will save this on the desktop as an HTML file. And I'll call it conversion.html. There we go. Doesn't do anything, but at least I got the appearance right. All right. What is the formula to convert Fahrenheit to centigrade? Oh, come on. It is. Yeah, that's a good question. It is. Fahrenheit, it's, it's nine-fifths, five-ninths, and plus or minus 32. Let's open up. How do I remember that? Because I do this example every single year. <laughs> so centigrade equals five-ninths times Fahrenheit minus 32. All right. I think that's right. And if you don't know any better, that is right. No, I'm just kidding. There are two numbers that we want to check, right? There's, there's two numbers you should know for doing this. 32 Fahrenheit equals 0 degrees centigrade, and 212 degrees Fahrenheit equals 100 degrees centigrade. That's the freezing point and boiling point of water. All right. So if I plug 32 in here, 32 minus 32 is 0. 0 times 5 ninths is 0. OK, that works. If I plug 212 in here, 212 minus 32 is 180. 5 ninths times 180 is 100. So both those work. So this is indeed is the correct formula. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to put on the on click event. I call a method called process form. And I'll create my script tag. I'll create my method. Function and method mean roughly the same thing. Oh, they mean the same thing. Notice that JavaScript is case sensitive. So I spelled process form like that with an uppercase P and an uppercase F. When I called it, I need to match that when I define the function. All the function is is it's a set of statements that I define, give a name to, that I can call by simply giving the name of the function. So I might have, by the time I'm done here, you know, 15 statements, 10 statements, 5 statements, whatever. But when I'm done, all I have to do is call process form and it will do all of them in sequence. All right. So describe to me what we would need to do to do this. I mean, you don't have to know the JavaScript, but what do you think this function is going to look like? Forget about validation for now. All right. All right. First thing it's going to do is it's going to grab actually three steps, all right, which is pretty common for almost any program, all right. Input, process, output, all right. Input, I'm going to grab the value from the text box, all right. So I now have the value in Fahrenheit. Process means I'm going to go and do the calculation. Output means I'm going to display the result here. So three statements, it should be. Grab the value from the text box. Do the calculation. Output the results. And I'm going to be a diligent programmer today, and I'm going to comment my code. And I'm actually going to comment the code before I write the code. 
which is a radical thought, right? That is a good idea, even though I don't always do it in class, all right? Um, just in the interest of time and because I'm here talking to you, explaining it to you, a good exercise, if you wanted to do it, would be to go after the lecture and look at my example and comment the code. That would be a good way to show or to, to, to identify if you've understood it. But just as, as modeling a good technique, I'm going to say get value from text box. Calculate result. Display result. All right, that's what we're doing. All right. These are written from a functional perspective, not a syntactical perspective. In other words, I'm explaining what the statement does, not the rules of JavaScript code. Like, I'm not saying set variable to value of text box or set whatever. I'm saying, I'm explaining why we're doing it. Get Fahrenheit value. That would be even a better comment. All right. So, I'm going to create a variable called F. Interesting thing about JavaScript. Unlike other languages, you don't have to declare variables. All right? You might say, yay, that's great. It actually isn't so great. It isn't great because it makes some assumptions for you, and it won't give you compile errors like other languages do. So, for example, if I declare a variable f, and then I, I was going to say misspell it, but it's kind of hard to misspell a single word variable. If I mistype it and type in e instead of f, it won't tell me, hey, there's no such variable as e. It'll think, and it won't recognize that I misspelled f. It'll just think I'm talking about a different variable. So it will proceed as though it's a brand new variable, which isn't good. All right, so I'm going to grab the value from the text box. Now, here, we've not done this in class before, all right? And, but, but we have done something similar to this. Actually, we have done this in class before, now that I think about it. How do we grab the value, value from a text box? What is our workhorse function? Get element by ID, right. And what's the ID of the text box? TXT temp. So I'm going to say F equals document. Get element by ID. And it's critical that we get the right spelling of that. All right. In other words, it's that's the case that it is. Then we put in the ID, txt tail. Now, strictly speaking, this part of the statement points to this text box. This text box is an object, all right? An object is a thing in a program that represents something else. In this case, the object represents the text box. Objects have all sorts of different attributes. The background color of this is an attribute. The position of it is an attribute. The size of it is an attribute. The font that's going to be inside of it is an attribute. We're not interested in any of those things. What are we interested in? We're interested in the value of the text box. Therefore, it isn't enough to say this. This will simply point to the text box. And there are occasions where you want to do that. But in our case, we don't want to point at the entire text box. We want to point specifically to the value of the text box. So I will say dot value. So that says, hey, find a thing on the page that is called txt temp 
and give me its value. And then it stores that value in the variable f. The whole idea of variables is we can put something there so we can do some calculations later on. All right. So now we have the value of the text box in our variable f. So now we can do our formula here. Notice, by the way, that every line in JavaScript ends with a semicolon. C equals 5 divided by 9 times this. Why do we put F minus 32 in parentheses? Because you want to do that first. If we did not include that in parentheses, then it would take 5 divided by 9, multiply that by f, and then subtract 32 from that. This is called the order of operations, and the parentheses um, indicate to do that first. If you have a whole set of nested parentheses, it works from the inside going out. Multiplication and division are above addition and subtraction. There's a couple of other things that happen first. Exponentiation, like if you raise something to the second power, um, or if you negate something. Those happen first. All right, so we have calculated the value of C. Now we want to display the results. How do we display the results? Put it, yeah, put it to, there's not a label, but to the LI. All right, and how do we do that? Inner HTML is a property. How do we point to this LI? Yeah, same way we use document get element by ID results. Pardon me? Dot value. Not dot value, but dot inner HTML. Okay. All right. The inner HTML is essentially the stuff between the start and end tag for that element. So we're actually writing to this right here. And we're writing HTML. All right. So I said enter HTML to equal to C. All right, let's save it and do our calculation. So I type in 100, or let's type in the easy ones. 212 is 100. Yay. 32 is 0. There's one where it's the same in both. It might be 42. No, that ain't it. Minus something, minus 20. Yeah, there's a value that is the same in centigrade and Fahrenheit. I forget what the value is. All right. We would want to test this. We would want to make sure that we didn't just test the one or two that we know. We'd want to go and actually manually do the calculation to make sure that we got it right. All right. Now, let's go and let's look at this and let's add some stuff to it. What if I wanted to emphasize the answer. In other words, the answer is there, that's fine, but let's say I wanted to strongly emphasize the answer. In other words, what I want to put here 
is I want to put a strong tag around this. All right. Now keep in mind there's a few ways that we could do this, but I'm going to do it this way. Remember that we're setting the HTML. So if I want to strongly emphasize this, if I want to put a strong tag, I simply go in here and write my tag. And then write my ending tag. Oops. All right. We're going to go back and look at this in more detail in a minute. Did I typo on anything? Yes, I forgot that. Okay. So now I type in something. I get the answer, and it is bold and strongly emphasized. All right. Now, let's look at this one statement. Document, get element by ID, results, enter HTML. All right. That finds the thing on the page as an ID of results and points to the inner HTML. So that's pretty straightforward. We've gone this. Let's look at this. And this is confusing for some students. So let's go over it. First thing to know is that JavaScript is what's called a weakly typed language. What does weakly typed language mean? What's the opposite of a weakly typed language? You could probably guess this even if you never programmed a day in your life. Strong. Strongly typed language. Very good. What's the difference between a weakly typed and a strongly typed language? Okay, in a strongly typed language, you have to declare the variable. And there's a little bit more, too, besides declaring it. You have to declare it as a certain type. Okay. So, in other words, in C Sharp, in Java, in, in P, not PHP, um, C Sharp, Java, um, Objective-C, uh, in many programming languages, you declare not just a variable, but you declare the type. So you say, this is a string, this is an integer, this is a date, this is a boolean, and so on down the line. JavaScript is weakly typed, which means you don't declare the type. In fact, you don't have to declare it at all. Well, what type is a variable then? Well, JavaScript sort of figures that out for you. And that can be good, and that can be bad. All right? It's good in a case like this, because up here, I'm treating C as though it's a numeric variable. Why? Because it's the result of a calculation. Right? This formula, this mathematical formula that gives me a result, is putting a value in C, that answer is some number. All right? So, Hey, that's kind of neat. I didn't even have to tell it it's a number. JavaScript figured out because I'm using it this way to treat it like a number. In this case, though, I'm not treating it like a number. I'm treating it like a string. All right? I can use the plus sign to concatenate strings. What does concatenate mean? It means put them together, one after another. So what I'm actually outputting into the inner HTML here is a start strong tag, the value of C, and then an end strong tag. All right. So, what's the difference between this and this? Strong is a literal. In other words, it doesn't represent the value of a variable. We're actually going to put these exact letters. The Triangle bracket, strong, other bracket, and then the ending tag. We're actually putting those letters in the HTML. All right? And it just so happens that's a tag. All right? C is not in quotes. That indicates that it's the value of a variable. Now, what if I did this? What would I get? In the results. I would get the actual letter C in there because
because that's a literal. I'm not asking for the value of the variable C because it's in quotes. I actually want the letter. So if I went in and did the conversion now, the answer is C. All right. So think of including in quotes as being like hard-coded. It's always going to be that. It's not going to change. Whereas things outside of quotes are going to change. What if I did this? And I forget the quotes around strong. What do you suppose is going to happen? Okay. You know something ain't going to be right, right? Actually, it kind of didn't do anything. Why did it not do anything? Well, it's giving me an error. In other words, this stuff isn't enclosed in quotes, so it kind of thinks that that's some kind of variable or function in JavaScript, but there isn't one. And therefore, it gave me an error. How do I know that? Well, because I've done this a trillion times. How would people that haven't done this a trillion times know this? You would look at the JavaScript error console within your browser. And these are in different places in different browsers, but most all of them have them. And in this case, it says, unexpected token, the bracket, that it also tells me process form is not defined. Now, again, it would be nice if, well, it wouldn't be polite, but it would be nice if the error message was like, hey, you big dummy, you forgot the quotes around strong. All right, and it would tell you exactly what's wrong. But remember, this isn't a person. This is a computer program that's, that's parsing and analyzing your code. So it knows it sees something that's wrong, it tells you from its perspective where it noticed something was wrong. And in this case, it notices wrong because a less than sign does not make any sense to it in its position. What about this? Process form is not defined. Process form is definitely defined. Where did it come up with that error? Right. In other words, this error caused the browser not to be able to understand that process form function. So it bails on that function. It doesn't even think it exists. All right. So that function did not load correctly into the browser, and so the browser doesn't know about that. So if you ever see an error that says that such and such is not defined, but it sure looks to you like it's defined. First of all, make sure you have the spelling right, all right, and uh, case sensitive and all that. And then secondly, make sure that you um, don't have some other kind of error that's keeping it from recognizing that that's a valid uh, function. So we can correct this, of course, simply by putting the quotes around here. What if I wanted to add the words degree centigrade here? How could I do that? What if instead of just displaying the number, I wanted to say degree centigrade? How, pardon me? Well, good, good question. Let's say I don't want it bolded. Do it on this side right here. And plus. I could I, I could do a plus, and then would I have it in quotes? Yes. Yes, because I want the actual word centigrade. Could you also just extend the strong quotes? Exactly. I could do that. That, oops. Okay. Not that. Not that. This is equivalent to this. And I'm going to put temperature Fahrenheit in there just to make it a little more usable. And now if I type in 
it says that centigrade. All right. Now, what if I type in George? What is George in centigrade? Pardon me? Let's find, Let's find out. out. Yeah. George is Nan. Huh? That's kind of weird. Is that George's nickname, like in Europe, where they use centigrade, or what does Nan mean? Close. Not a number. All right. Not a number. All right. Likewise, if I do this. It says negative 17 point something degrees centigrade. What do you think that is doing? It's using, probably using zero. So I want to do some validation here. All right. So I am going to do validation. I'm going to show you the way I would do this. All right, and you might say this is a couple extra steps, whatever. All right, this is the way I would do it because it makes for more maintainable code. All right, I could put all the validation in this and have everything in one function, the validation and the calculation. Generally speaking, you're better off if you can divide, divide functions so that each function performs just one task. So I'm going to make a function to do the validation, and then I'm going to do a function to do the calculation. All right? So I'm going to copy this code, because I know this code works. And I'm going to create a new function called do calculation. So I, all I did was I moved it from one function to another. Everything else stays the same, still the same form with all that. Now, how do I call the function do calculation here? I just, like I always call the name of, uh, always call a function by putting in the name of it. So I could say do calculation. And if I did that, this is going to work exactly like it did a minute ago. All right. So I type in something, it does a calculation and displays the results. All right. Now, let's do the validation. And I'm going to create a function called do validation. And there's going to be a whole bunch of statements in here that look at the text box and make sure, first of all, that there's something in there. Second of all, that um, whatever I put in there isn't some nonsense like George or a value that I can't process. Will this method or function have a return value? This one doesn't have a return value. This thing just does its thing and changes the page. Will this guy have a return value? You bet it will. What's it going to return? It's going to return a Boolean. It's going to return true or false. True means, yes, it passed validation. False means that, nope, it didn't pass validation. Well, guess what? We're running out of time. I can't write this whole function. But... I can do this. I'm going to define a variable. Remember, it's easier to code it if you assume that it's valid and then look for cases where there's errors as opposed to looking to make sure everything is right. 
I'm going to put a comment in here so I remember next Monday that I'm not done with this. All right. And then I'm going to return the value of B valid. What's this going to do for me now? It's going to say it's valid no matter what I put in. In other words, I'm no worse off than I was before, right, with doing no validation because I haven't finished the validation. But I've put in place a framework that I can go back later and alter. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to say if, uh, I'll do this. I could do this a few different ways. If, do validation, do calculation. Someone care to explain to me what this means? Right. This is an if statement. If statements always evaluate to a Boolean. A Boolean is a statement that's either true or false. So do validation better be a function that returns either true or false. Because JavaScript is weakly typed, it's possible it could return something else. But we're good programmers, we're going to make sure it returns only true or false. So, it's going to call that function and it's going to look at the result. If the result is true, it's going to do the calculation. If the result is false, it's not going to do the calculation. Now, in this case we've rigged the deck. We haven't really written any validation at all. We're just assuming it's good. So in this case, every single time, it's going to return true, and we're going to display the result. So let's go and do that. All right. All right. It's doing that. And even if we don't put anything in, it's going to go and do that. This is called a stub function. All right. In the words of Tyra Banks, you got to fake it till you make it. All right. We're going to pretend we have a function until we actually write the function. So you could consider this to be a pretend function. It looks like a function, but it doesn't do everything it's supposed to. Now, here's the nice thing about this. Everything else about my page is done. I just need to focus on this one piece of it and get that one piece correct. Once that one piece gets correct, everything will fall into place. In fact, I can test my stub function by changing this to assume the form's always false. And in which case, no matter what I type in, it doesn't do the calculation. Now, Next week, what we'll do, one of the first things we'll do, will be to go and complete this validation, to actually look for it. You could probably do some of this on your own, because we have done some validation already. So you could validate for the text box not being there. Um, with a little bit of research, you could validate to find out if that text box is a number or not, too. All right. This is where we'll pick up next time with finishing up the validation, and then adding some more features to this example.